let's kind of summarize uh, Daniel chapter 11. Uh, kings of the north. Here we have the kings of the north. What do we start with? Who was the first one mentioned as kings of the north? No. What's that? Oh, Babylon. Okay. The, when we first started Daniel 11, what was the first king of the north? It focused on Greece. And remember, we did the Seleucid Empire with the kings of the north. That's. Remember, we started with uh, the Seleucid Empire because they were in Syria. They were fighting against the Ptolemies, which were in Egypt. And in between the two was the nation of Israel. So God's people were in between the king of the north and the king of the south, right? Then, after the Seleucid Empire, Greece, I mean, uh, we did, it went to Pagan, or we could say, Imperial Rome, spell that right. Is it this one? Yeah. Is better? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we got pagan or imperial Rome. And we went from Julius Caesar all the way to Titus. Right, and then after that, it was papal wrong. And uh, the first phase, it, it covered both phases of papal wrong. Was when we did the uh, the time period of five to the eighth, seventeen hundreds. Then there was papal wrong. We could say revitalized or resurrected you know after 1929 when this event started so it's two phases right the first phase and this would be the second phase so any questions about kings of the north in the book of daniel chapter 11 Pastor, do you put the first phase from Greece all the way down to Papal Rome, or are you just going Papal Rome was the first phase? Yeah, Papal Rome was the first phase of Papal Rome. Oh, the first phase of Papal Rome. Of Papal Rome, right. And then the second phase of Papal Rome, right? So they received the deadly wound in 1798. They didn't have any political power between 1798 and 1949. And after that, the resurrection started, or the revital, revitalization of it. But we're in the second phase, right? We're in the last of the kings of the north, given in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. Uh, so we can see what is essentially the kings of the north represent the enemy of God's people, right? We can sum it up that way. Can we say that? The enemy is God's people. So that's how you would sum it up. What about uh, kings of the south? Starting with Greece. We start with Greece. Yeah, it's Ptolemy and his empire, right? And what do we call this country? Egypt. Egypt. And we see that's represented all down through Daniel chapter 11. And then when we go to Revelation chapter 11, we see Egypt show up again, don't we? So it physically represents them here. And then it, 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 it changes as we go deeper or go along to Daniel chapter 11 into symbolically representing Egypt, which is what, what do we call that? When 
Remember how Pharaoh says, I'm not going to have this man. I'm not going to have, uh, you know, who is the God? Yeah, atheism, right? So when we went to Revelation chapter 11 to kind of follow up on when we see Egypt in the latter part of Daniel chapter 11, he's referring to the same Egypt in Revelation chapter 11, right? So we start off physically talking about the Ptolemy Empire, which they they had the area of Egypt, what we know as Egypt today. And then uh, in Revelation chapter 11, spiritually it's called Egypt, but what is it representing today? What do we call that? Agnosticism, Agnosticism atheism, communism. communism. So essentially, what we have is this: we, we have the in, in the latter part of Daniel chapter eleven, revitalized papacy on one end and communism on the other end, right? And God's people's in the middle. Okay. So this is where we're at when we look at the very last few verses of Daniel chapter eleven. What does? Ammon, Moab, Edom represent in those last few verses of Daniel chapter 11. <coughs> so we have Ammon, Moab, Edom. We said that represented because now it's symbolic, right? The latter part, the last part of Daniel chapter 11 represents. I mean, Daniel didn't know anything about Protestantism, right? So all he saw was there is a relationship between these groups of people who were physically related to God's people, Israel, in the Old Testament. So here we have at the end of time, God's people as identified in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, is that they keep the commandments of God, have the testimony in the faith of Jesus, right? So they, they're Sabbath-keeping Christians. And how do you show a relationship between them with the other churches? They're similar. They're all part of Christianity. But in Christianity, there's a remnant. And the remnant's identified as Sabbath-keeping Christians. And so that's how we apply Ammon, Moab, and Edom to apostate Protestantism. Daniel didn't know what to call it. I mean, he wouldn't have called it that because he didn't know anything about Protestantism, right? But when we get to the book of Revelation, we see that it's a threefold union of the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism that's attacking God's people, the remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony in the faith of Jesus. Okay? So we, we drew a parallel between them and apostate Protestantism in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. Okay. Well, what about it? Mentions another group of people there, doesn't it? Daniel chapter 11. And it says in verse 42 the Libyans and the Ethiopians. Is that yeah. spiritual? No, it's the far reaches, it's the other peoples, right? Doesn't Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 say the whole world wandered after the beast? All right. Well, here you have uh the papacy, and you have this uh ideology of communism, which is prevalent in some countries that we could name, and you have apostate Protestantism. What about the rest of the world? Are they gonna follow the papacy? That's what it says, right? And so the far reaches of the earth, the rest of the people that aren't mentioned in this, in this group is also mentioned there by the Libyans and the Ethiopians in Daniel chapter 11. What else would Daniel call them, right? The whole world. Yeah, exactly. That's everyone, right? Right. So you have all the groups covered there in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel uses terms that he was familiar with in his day, right? I mean, that's what he called them. How much of this do you think Daniel understood? 
Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it, doesn't really, it doesn't really say. It. So it's just kind of interesting. So just a lot of symbolism, future information. Well, God, it's, it's almost like God showed him the vision. And he wrote it down in terms that he understood, right? That's why he called apostate Protestantism the Ammon, Moab, and Edom, because mm -hmm. they were similar or connected, or uh, there was a family connection to the actual descendants of Abraham, right? So we just apply what is Israel today is spiritual Israel. What is spiritual Ammon, Moab, and Edom? It is... Uh, the the part of Christianity that's following the papacy, right? They believe in Sunday sacredness. They believe in immortality of the soul. They believe in the secret rapture. So I, I think, uh, I don't think he understood like we understood it, right? We, we take what he, what he was familiar with and we apply it to what we know today, the symbolism. You know, he would have had, <laughs> even when John comes along, he gives us more information that helps us make a better decision, doesn't he? And see, that's why Daniel didn't understand it, because we have, we have John's revelation. We do, that's right. To, to, to prepare to combine. combine and see why that interpret. That's true. Libyans and Ethiopians, they all uh, are spirits. Scripture, so I mean, they believe in life after death, I believe they can do that third, because this would be Catholicism and Catholicism, and that third. Yeah, I can see that too, right? So she's saying that the Ethiopians and Libyans that are mentioned there in verse 43, uh, they're associated with spiritualism because they believe, as most false religions do. In the immortality of the soul, right? You know, Daniel chapter eleven is one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible to understand. And, you know, we spent significant time going through Daniel chapter eleven in detail. Um, who tell me? There's one significant person we've got to mention here in verse twenty-two. Who's Prince of the Covenant? Jesus. All right. So we can put that down too. So, I think when you go through and try to understand what the different symbols represent, you get a better picture of what it's talking about. And the last section of Daniel chapter 11, and that starts there in uh, verse 40 to 45, he says, at that time, Daniel shall stand up, I mean, Michael shall stand up in uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. So, we're talking about this time, right? We're talking about when this is here. We're talking about when this is here. When we have at that time in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Michael stands up. So let me ask. I think we could go through and show. We need to be able to show from the Bible. I'm going to erase this. Is who's Michael? Jesus. Okay. <coughs> Tell me how to show that Michael represents Christ. What's that? Jude. Okay, Jude 9 you're talking about? Okay. All right. So when we look at what Michael representing Christ, I think we could start with his name. What does Michael mean? Like, like, like God. God. Okay. So we actually have that. When you look at his name, what is this in the Hebrew? Yes, God. One who is like God. So we can start with his name and say, who in the world uh, would be named Michael as just an angel? I mean, this is talking about God himself, isn't it? 
Okay, so I think you can start with the name. Michael's mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. And when we start there in verses 7 to 9, and we read that section, what is it talking about there? Can somebody read that? You want to read that? I'm here. I got it. We already got it. Great. And there were four in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old servant called the devil and Satan was perceived to the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So notice that the term Michael is used in the context there of a conflict, a war. And we see it's between Michael and the dragon. And we know in verse 9 that the dragon represents Satan. Lucifer a fallen angel and the demons have fallen him. So we see, I want you to notice that the term Michael is used when a conflict is taking place. Now we're going to go, when Lori said Jude 9, tell me what's going on in Jude 9. He's contending for body of Okay. So now it calls Michael the archangel, and he's contending, right? There's conflict for the body of Moses. And archangel means, you know, what is an arch? About. Above. It just means he's head over the angels, right? He's commander of the host. That's what it means. So archangel means commander or head over the angels. Okay. So Robert says, now let's go to First Thessalonians chapter 4. 16. Let's do verse 16. What does it say there about? What's it say about the archangel? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven and shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise. So, so notice it's the voice of the archangel. The only one we know of mentioned in the Bible is Michael, raises the dead. Raises the dead. You see that? At the second coming of Christ, the voice of the archangel is the one that raises the dead. All right? What did Jesus say? Whose voice raises the dead in John chapter 5? Uh, let's see, I think it's 28 and 29. Let's try those two verses so they could read those. Yeah, they're already in heaven. Right, right. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4 16, it says, The Lord Himself shall descend with the voice of the archangel. So, I've got those two the same. <clears throat> yep. It's the Lord's voice. I agree. You really don't have to go past this, do you? Okay. Scott's made a great point is when you really think about 1 Thessalonians 4 16, it says, The Lord. And then it says the voice of the archangel. So you could say, you could just use that one verse to show that it's the Lord's voice called the voice of the archangel that raises the dead, right? You really don't even have to go to John chapter 5. Well, what does Jesus say in John 5, 20 and 29? Marvel not at this, but the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth that they have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus' voice raises the dead. Okay? So, using these four passages, we can clearly show from the word of God and using the New Testament, because Michael is mentioned there in Daniel chapter 10, as well as Daniel chapter 12. And using the New Testament, we can show that Michael is another term for Christ. Anybody have any issues with that, Jeremy? I'm reminded you when Lazarus died. Martha's, I am the resurrection. 
that, you know, and, and he's the one who Jesus' voice is the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. Right. But also, you know, he says, I am the resurrection. Yes, the Christ was resurrected. And he is responsible for our resurrection. Right, so right. So it's really, I mean, to me, he demonstrated that right there, right there on the when he raised Lazarus. He demonstrated that his voice had carried power to raise Amen. That's true. That's true. So, we could use John chapter 11 as a good illustration of what's going on here, right? What he's talking about there. Brother, you had have, you have your hand up? So it's interesting how you're, you're, that's a very good point you're bringing up. So notice how in, uh, it says, what does it call him? The great prince in 12.1, right? So great prince. And what's interesting about this word prince here, look in Joshua, whenever he's, um, trying to decide how to conquer the promised land as God told him to, right? And Joshua, he spends some time, I guess, away from Israel, away from his people, and he goes out, <coughs> and it came to pass in verse 13 of Joshua chapter 5, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn, in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And this man that he saw said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. The word commander and the word prince are the exact same word. And notice what happens here. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And notice how. Uh, this being, this commander of the Lord's army, didn't say, oh, don't worship me, I'm just an angel. He didn't do that, right? It's Jesus. Yeah, because it's Jesus. He allowed the worship to take place because he is the commander, right? And that word prince is the same word for commander there in Joshua chapter 5. And let's see, it, <clears throat> verse 14. So when you got Daniel 12, verse 1, using the same word as in Joshua 5, 14. So the same Hebrew word for prince is the same for commander. Uh, uh, going back to Revelation 12, I think we should include verse 10 in there because... As a result of Satan being defeated by Michael there, there is rejoicing in heaven for the strength of God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. So it, it relates Michael to the strength of Christ there for casting out. Oh, Satan. good point. That's a great point. <clears throat> yeah, so when you put all this together, it's clear to see that Michael represents Christ in the Bible. What, what gets me is what's, you know, sometimes I don't understand why other denominations don't see this. They don't see the truth about the Sabbath. They don't see the truth about the state of the dead. They don't see the truth about the second coming, and they don't see the truth about Michael is Christ. He doesn't fit their narrative. He doesn't fit their narrative. So... When you bring this up and you talk and you say Michael represents Christ and you're talking to somebody in another denomination that's done a lot of study on this, they're going to think that you're committing idolatry by worshiping an angel instead of worshiping Christ. Brother? Well, 
Yes. Can you speak up just a tad because Mark wants to hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's very common that it's being taught that I believe it's the whole Darius at the time. Okay. That he didn't know who the fourth person was. It was basically how he related it according to his Babylonian God. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's not accurate. The spirit of prophecy that's not accurate. Now, what I want to do is bring something out of the game. I don't think you actually see it. When it comes to the angel, when you describe Christ, and that's when you describe it. Okay, so you have the first thing he said was in verse 25, this is verse 25. It says, in the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I don't yeah. know a Babylonian king that compares any of their gods to the Son of God. Yeah, that's a good point. What does it say in the NIV there, uh, Bill? This is Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter 3. Verse 25. Verse, verse 25. Daniel 3, 25. What's the same in the NIV? The fourth looks like a son of the gods. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Um, 26 is another aspect of how it's described in Christ. Okay. The most high God. I don't know any other Babylonian that used the word earth, the most high God. Yeah, good point. Third way he's describing Jesus his angel delivered his servants. That would be like Michael, the archangel. I mean, all yeah, of these yeah. men in verse 8 of uh, Chapter 4, he said, The spirit of the holy God. Now, him to a Babylon king, how did, he, how did he know all these different aspects of really true aspects of the God? You have yeah. the spirit of the holy God, you have the angel who is Michael, the archangel, he is the son of the living God. Obviously, you must have had this revelation from God. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, he shared it with Nebuchadnezzar. Christ, first came angel. Forget what it is. Michael was archangel, commander of the angels. Yep, amen. Yeah, you can clearly see it. Once you know it, you can go back and see it clearly, can't you? Yeah, that's a very good point. All right. Anybody have any questions about this? To establish who Michael is, we're going to go forward. What, what do you think, uh, Barbara? What do you, you think? You think Tom's got it okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So back to Daniel chapter twelve. At that time, Michael should stand up. We establish what time we're talking about. We've established who Michael is, and now we've got to establish what standing up is. So standing up is a, a term that symbolizes the end of the process that's been going on in Daniel chapter uh, 11, verses 40 to 45. It's a process of the pre-advent judgment. So when he stands up, he's saying it's finished. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. I, I think that's a good reference to put next to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. I think they're talking about a similar event. Whenever Ellen White saw this in vision, she saw this with Michael standing up, the end of the pre advent or the investigative judgment. You know, everybody's case is settled. Uh, God's kingdom and the people who are going to populate his kingdom have been decided. And we have this ending of the investigative judgment in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I want you to see <clears throat> that the book of Daniel tells us the results of this investigative judgment. 
This judgment process starts there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Um, I watched till thrones were put in place. The ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels of burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. And we say this happened in starting in 1798. And then we have in verse 13, I was watching in the night vision to behold one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the end of the days and they brought him near before him. So Christ then moves from the holy place to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary <coughs> and starts the process of the investigative judgment in the year 1844. We know it's 1844 because wrote Daniel chapter 8, verse 14 tells uh, verses uh, 14 tells us about the 2300 year prophecy which ended in 1844 right so that's how we get 1844 and then verse 14 in daniel chapter 7 to him was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages to serve him and this is the kingdom of the people whose sins were blotted out so let me, let me say this whenever you confess your sins in the name of Jesus, and because that he shed his blood on the cross, provided a way for your sins to be taken from you and placed into the heavenly sanctuary, because it has to be cleansed. That's Daniel chapter, I mean, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Okay, so your sins are covered. Psalms 32, verse 1. Okay, what does it say in Psalms 32, 1? What's it say there? Psalms 32, 1. So your sin is covered in Psalms 32, 1. But guess what? It's not blotted out yet. Okay? And when your name comes up in the investigative judgment, and you are sealed as one, as one of God's people, Right? That's when your sin is blotted out. And that's Isaiah 44, verse 22. What's it say there? Blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So this blotting out takes place as a result of your name coming up in the investigative judgment. And what happens is you have confessed and forsaken your sins because of the blood of Jesus. Your sins were covered. They were transferred from you to the holy, the sanctuary in heaven. And at that point in time, when your name comes up, uh, if you maintain your walk with Jesus, guess what? Your sins are blotted out. They don't exist anymore, right? They're going to be taken and put on the head of Satan whenever Jesus comes at the second coming. That's the beautiful thing about the investigative judgment. Your sins, why did David look forward to the judgment? Because his sins will be blotted out. They're not going to exist anymore. There's not going to be no record of him ever sinning, you see. We'll have the Bible in heaven, though. Yes? David's story is in there. You know, after the new earth, right? You know, it's interesting. And that's what I don't know and don't understand fully is we're not going to be thinking about the sins we committed in the past. <laughs> They're going to be gone. We're not going to be thinking about that. We are going to be thinking about how he redeemed us, how he saved us. We're going to know that. But to dwell on our sins. Yeah, we're not going to be thinking about that. Jeremy, Jeremy. <laughs> if someone were to say, well, how do you know that blotted and covered aren't really the same thing? We can say because of the, the design of the sanctuary. Right. That's exactly right. When we study the sanctuary message, we know that the sins were not cleansed, that they confessed all year long. They, they, they confessed they were symbolically transferred to the sanctuary, right, all year long. But on the Day of Atonement, right, they cleansed the sanctuary. And the sins were taken out and put on the scapegoat. And so we see that as a parallel. That's how we know our sins are blotted out removed from the sanctuary there's no record of them anymore right what happens if here you live this life of confessing your sins and they were covered by the blood but then 
you decided that you wanted to live the ways of the world and you turn your back on your relationship with Jesus, what happens to that person? Revelation 3, 5. What happens to that person? Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Does that does not that verse show that there's a possibility that your name can be blotted out of the book of life? Right? So you have a choice. Your sins can be blotted out, or your name can be blotted out. Which are you going to choose, brother? That's exactly right. You know, the, the verbiage there doesn't say that you're once saved, always saved, does it? Notice Ezekiel chapter 18. Verse 24, when a righteous man, this is a person who has connected to God, they, they were in the, in the process of being sanctified, they were going through that sanctification process, they were confessing and forsaking their sin, but they got to a sin that they decided they cherished more than they did the Savior, and they didn't want to let go of that sin, right? That's what this verse is talking about. When a righteous man, we can say person, turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live. All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. So, what's that? This is Ezekiel 18.24. Because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall, shall die. So notice, there is the possibility of a person, even though their name was written in the book of life, when they accepted their Savior, right? If they turn away from that relationship, notice he's, he specifically says in here, because of the unfaithfulness. Now that... Faithfulness is trust. Every relationship is based on trust. Our relationship with God is based on trust. Our relationship with each other is based on trust. Every relationship, right? Right. When you're trustful, you're faithful, okay? But when you turn your back on that trust, it's called unfaithfulness. And so that's what this person has done in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 24, as they turn their back on Wanda. Jesus said, I think I don't know where, but um, you know, you'll come to me and say, Oh, I healed, I helped this person. This person says, I don't know you. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Yeah, <clears throat> down in Matthew chapter 7, starting verse 21. Uh, so, the question that that is asked a lot um, is, Well, what if my name has already come up in the judgment? and I still find myself struggling, you know, uh, you know, where's the, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> like, where, where's, what kind of confidence can I have in a scenario like that? Wait. Well, I, I think struggling is evidence of salvation, right? A person who isn't struggling, who just gives in to their temptation and desires or, or uh, unholy desires. That person is the one who is, you know, should be, should be afraid, right? Mm -hmm. But a person who, I mean, when you have the temptation come along, and sometimes we get discouraged because we're tempted and we think the temptation itself is a sin, mm -hmm. uh, that's not the case, right? I mean, you're, you can struggle with the temptation. It doesn't mean that you're sinning, right? Brother, you got your hand up? Um, a struggle is a struggle. If there's a struggle there, that means there's somebody that's going against what it wants to do. Put it this way Romans chapter 7 is an excellent, you know, chapter to read yeah. on that yeah. struggling and trying to get. Yeah, Paul struggled, didn't he? Yes. 
I but I want to make a point with what uh, the lady just said about Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. Okay. The key here is the last sentence in chapter It three. is, isn't it? It's a great, it's a great phrase. <clears throat> and they, and then I will confess to them, until I never knew you, apart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. Now, another translation says, practices lawlessness. That's right. There's a difference between struggling with something and actually practicing breaking the law. Two are actually practicing breaking the law. That's a decision to continue to keep sitting and doing what you do. Okay, that's a great point. Notice what it says in 1 John chapter 3. Let's read verse 8. But don't dare read verse 9. <laughs> Let me hear somebody read verse 8 and let's see if you got the guts to read verse 9. <laughs> First John chapter 3. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. Whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Okay. That can be a discouraging verse, can't it? Because every one of us in here, I think, has struggled with committing a sin this past week. Right? Did you ever hand up, Gabriel? That's the point you were making, brother, right? And that's exactly what I wanted to bring up. Notice what it says in the NIV there. Eight or nine. Verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. So, so notice this practicing, like you're saying, continuing in. You know, when you read it in the King James or New King James, it almost sounds like a person who commits a sin isn't born of God. That's not what it's saying. It's saying a person who's living a lifestyle of sin isn't born of God. You see the difference? Yeah. Seal. Okay, so let's talk about the sealing. When your name comes up in the judgment, right? And your sins are blotted out. You're sealed. You don't know you're sealed. Do you still struggle? Absolutely. Right? But you're not going to give in to the struggle. You're sealed. Okay? You're not going to give. Do you, do you stand up and say, oh, guess what? I haven't sinned in a week. I haven't sinned in a month. I have. I'm sinless. You're right? sitting right now. Yeah, exactly. You'll never do that. You'll never do that, even though you have, uh, you, even though your names come up, even though you've been sealed, even though all your sins have been blotted out of the record books in heaven. Right? You won't know you'll still feel like a sinner in need of saving grace. Brother? Um, I don't like to say, uh, if you sell it, if you sold seven into the truth, you're not going to move. Yeah, yeah, isn't that also? Sold seven into the truth. So we won't know the facts. And also says during this time, the faith of trouble, people ask me, refer to all my things, did I, did I uh, confess all my sins, did I, you know, because you know we're not worthy, you know we have sin, but all the things you can drive on is believe. Christ. And that's what you brought up. You know, the faith. You got to have the faith. Lori? I was just you know, basically going to say what he said that, you know, at the end of time when when Jesus is coming down and we're feeling, even though our every thought is on him, our anguish is that we have maybe not had an unconfessed sin. And we're totally sealed at that point, even without a savior. Yeah. So when it says, it mentions this time of trouble there, doesn't it? That's the time of trouble we're talking about. Is we're living, we'll be living in a time where the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn uh, from every everyone who's rejected the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will stay in a person who's saved, whose name has not been blotted out of the book of life, but whose sins are blotted out. The people who have survived, you know, uh, and we have. The angelic hosts that were cast out of heaven, who are now the demons, right, have full power on the earth. Mm -hmm. We'll be living during a time like this. I think a very short period of time. That's actually after the close of probation. That's what, that's what yes, exactly right. After the close of probation, 
And so uh, it's a time of trouble like there never has been because Satan's going to have full sway on this earth, right? Uh, you won't have anybody sitting on the fence. You won't have anybody here with a conscience except the ones who've been sealed. And guess who they're going to come after? But God will send angels to protect us, Jeremy. What will be Satan's motivation? Will he know when that sealing takes place? Because if he, if he, if he does, then what's the purpose of trying to sway the people who have been sealed? But if he doesn't, then I can understand why he. You know, I can understand why he's continuing to wreak havoc. Well, I think what he's looking at is the great controversy thing. You know, uh, maybe he has some type of insight about. You know, obviously there are people now who've already been sealed, right? I mean, they're, they, he started with the dead, this investigative judgment, and the ones who've died, I mean, they're sealed. They're going to be resurrected, you know? I mean, their, their fight is over, right? Uh, we're still in the fight. And when he, when he moves to the living and we're sealed, right, what does Satan want to do? He wants to destroy us. Right. Not try to get us to sin, because you know he wants to kill us, yes. and that's what that's that's what he wants to do is obliterate any evidence of Christ on this earth, and that's going to be through his people, right? <laughs> that's what he wants to do. Somebody else, okay? So, right. Certainly, he knows that if he does destroy him, he's just going to turn around and raise him up again, right? Well, you know that's the deception of sin. Or he just so Why does he think up? he can still win this even after the thousand years? The devil still thinks he can win this great controversy, right? Remember when the wicked are resurrected at the end of the thousand years? He goes out and he tells them, I'm the one that resurrected you. Let's take the city, right? He still thinks he can win this. It's a deception, right? I believe that uh, the Bible says, you know, the Bible like the wrong line, sleeping only in the Bible, he knows the bad for his first time. You're dealing with a man that can know he's going to die. So how about, I think there's many people out here who are possible, you know, so... Kind of hurt Christ. That's what he does. That's exactly right. But her, by hurting us, it hurts Christ, right? When we see our children get hurt, it hurts us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Right, Scott? Do you, do you think um, God waits for the like the moment he knows when we've made our final decision? Like, I mean, like Manasseh, like he lived a horrible life, and then at the very end, he apparently he chose the Lord. So, I mean, you know, because I've had so many people ask me, you know, do you, well, does God go alphabetically? <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, my name ends with the letter A, or, and they're concerned that they've already been passed over, you know. And, but if they're concerned, then they know they have it there. Right. It's just, I mean, I mean, people whose names are blotted out of the book a lot, only, it's only a people who's professed believers who are in the pre heaven judgment, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the wicked. A majority of the people aren't professed believers, right? And a person's concern, a believer's concern that their name has passed over, then they don't have to be concerned because um, if if they had been blotted out of the book of life, they wouldn't have any conscience, right? Okay. The Holy Spirit has left them. They've already rejected They've already rejected, right? There's no, they wouldn't be concerned about it. Mm -hmm. So having the concern is evidence the Holy Spirit is still in their life. Right? Well, it, it seems like there's there's some complexity to that that I I can't fully understand because if you're born in a different century and you in a different region and you had no exposure to what we call Christianity, when did they get passed over? You know what I'm what, saying? What do you like mean by passed over. I'm not, I'm well, sure. like if you if you didn't traditionally hear the story of Jesus Christ, let's call it you know fifteen something, and you're in Native America, you know, before Columbus and before you're one of the Aztecs. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so what about so you? You have no chance to get saved because you never heard of Jesus, right? Unless we just say that they had no option. Or they had no ability to be. We don't say that. Well, I think we're also judged according to the light that we have. Correct. Is the Holy Spirit present there in the 15, in the, the 16th century? I have to believe he is. Yeah. Did, as oh, the Aztecs right. and the Mayans, and did some of them have the opportunity? I would 
have to believe that. Absolutely, right? We're told right. that there'll be people in heaven that's never heard the name of Jesus. That's right. right. Why do you have the nail prints in your hand, brother? No, that's actually very Romans chapter 2 really gets into that. Uh, child, we cannot have the law of demons, instincts, the things contained in the law, we cannot have the law, our laws themselves. Right. Uh, there are countries that are excluding or excluding themselves. You know, God has given, and Ellen White talks about this, I think the second selected message is, I can't remember, he talks about it's not the amount of life you have received, but but what you have done with the life that you have received. You have people that do not have, that die without knowing or coming to the full conviction that the Sabbath was the Sabbath. Hello, Martin Luther. Hello, uh, um, uh, our pioneer, uh, William Miller, which was revealed to him, but he didn't. What convicted him like that? Who will be saved? So <coughs> God sets the rules and he applies them how he sees fit. And that merciful and just in it. I Amen. Amen. Any other comments? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, right. let's talk about faith. And then chapter 11 of Hebrews, it talks about faith. Chapter. And it says they all have a good report. It started out with the elders having a good report. And when you finish the chapter, he's having a good report. So, what is that good report? Okay. You are you are saved by grace through faith, right? And not of yourselves. You are judged according to your works. You see that? All right. What do you think about that? Is that a good statement? Very confusing. Is it confusing? If you don't understand it very well. Okay. So tell me in Matthew 16, verse 27, how are you rewarded according to what? Matthew 16, 27. Then we'll, we'll come to you. Matthew 16, 27. How are you rewarded? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. According to what? His works. His works. You see that? You know, there is a difference. Your people get mixed up between salvation and the reward for works. There is a difference between the two. When your name comes up in the judgment. Salvation is based upon, have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you put all your trust in the merits of Christ's perfect, righteous life? Have you put all your trust in his shed blood on the cross as payment for your sins? That's what salvation is based on. But the, you get a reward, right? And your reward is based on what you've done with this, your works. So don't, don't combine the two together. There's two separate things, Okay. So we've got, okay, we got Melissa, and then we got you, brother. Um, I'm wondering, because I know a lot of people that might get rewarded, but they don't get salvation. Oh, you mean they have a lot of good works? Right. Right. But good works, okay, here's the rich young ruler. I'd like to see what reward that would be. Here, the, the rich young ruler had good works, yes. right? But he's not going to be rewarded for those works in the afterlife. And the thief on the cross had the salvation, but he doesn't have the works. It's That's exactly that. right. It's exactly right. It would be interesting to see what that reward will be. What do you mean? What that reward will be? He's not going to get a reward. But the reward is what they experience in a lifetime. They want to be seen by yeah, people. Exactly. Right. Have exactly. And Jesus exactly. said that it, when he said to the, the ruler, you've gotten your reward because yeah. you wanted to be seen by men. Where the person was beating his chest and saying, I'm not worthy to even pray to you. That's exactly right. They get the reward on this earth. There's not the eternal reward. Do right. you think the stars in the crown is literal? Because if it is, I don't know what Billy Graham's going to do that. The crown is going to be so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, you want to make a comment on that on that topic, and then we'll go to his question. Okay. The thief on the cross shows his works. According to what Ellen White said, by the thinking the other leader that not. So he did have some works, didn't he? Yes. So what it is is your works is an excellent subject. Amen. Amen. Now you're in James, aren't you, brother? No, we didn't. I didn't hear it. Your works are evidence of your faith. That's what James. I don't understand what grace is. They simply label it as unfavored. I mean, um, 
unmerited, yeah. unmerited favor with God. But what we have to understand is grace is the divine ability and capability to do that we cannot do of ourselves. It's really the power of God working in us. So how can we say we have 100% full faith in God, but yet the grace that he bestows upon us to overcome sin, be victorious over sin, does not allow us to do it? So yeah, yeah. But Good so, point. so it's the evidence of it. Yeah. Unless, so, so grace <clears throat> isn't just a concept. Yes. Right? What does Ella White say? She says it's as real as the air that we breathe, right? And it gives us the power to overcome. Right. And any command that God has given us is a promise that by his grace you can accomplish, right? That's the beauty of it. Okay. I just want to say I had a hard time you know, understanding the, the war in heaven and all this just never hit home, you know. But after summer was taken, by some evil entity or whatever, then I kind of understood maybe a little bit about how God has felt in the world. Oh, yeah. But the thing that all this bad stuff has been going on, you know. Yeah. You know, I've been kind of riding the fence and everything. You know, I understand a lot better, I guess. That's right. Like when Abraham was about to slay his son, he got an understanding of how God felt when he actually had to turn to, you know, allow his son to be slain. You know, talk about Satan and, you know, his in law for, you know, well, why would he want to kill people that are saved when he knows they're already saved? You know, in Isaiah 14, it says, you have destroyed the land and slaughtered your children. So even the children that belong to him, he still wants to, to slaughter. No, no, no what parent wants to slaughter their children, exactly. and that's what his MO is. Right, good point. Yeah. The more he kills, the less he'll have to pay. <clears throat> the more to pay people accidents. that suffer for their own sins, right. the less that he has suffered. Right. Right. Judy? Well, one thought that I have is that you have a person that lives a very good life, a godly life, a really good man. Something horrible happened in his family, and he goes out, and he just goes ballistic. He gets drunk, and he's he's just going off on people, and they're, he's fighting with them and all. And then some somebody comes over and shoots him. Satan thinks, now I got him. But God knows the heart, and he knows what happened that made him behave that way. Yeah. And God has already forgiven him, so Satan doesn't get that person. Even though he's thinking he will. I'm glad that God is the judge. <laughs> Scott, our last comment. Okay, so just for clarification, in Matthew 16, 27, um, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Are we are we saying that reward and judge are the same thing, or are they two different things? Well, they're two different things, but I was using them synonymously in my statement. Because we're, when God judges us, he, does, he doesn't, he judges us based on Christ's character, right? For salvation, you're exactly right. Yeah. Right. But there is a judgment for reward. You know? In other words, a decision for reward has to be made. It's not a judgment for salvation. Right. Yeah. Father in heaven, we do praise you and thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness. We're supplying everything that we need in order to be saved. We look to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Glad you could join us, Sandy. Hope your call is better. No, but thank you anyway. Robin's here rubbing me. Well, be sure to tell her hello for me, if you don't mind. Say something. Hello. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's good to hear y'all's voice. Thank you.